In the 21st century, we have advanced technology that allows us to predict stormy weather days in advance. Radar, weather satellites, and emergency management systems warn us about impending tornadoes and other severe weather conditions. But imagine a time when none of this existed. No sirens, no media warnings. The only alarm was reports from people who already experienced the storm. Welcome to the year 1875. In 1875, people relied on their senses and signs from nature to predict the weather. Doing so made them vulnerable to sudden and devastating natural disasters. Tornadoes are common in the South, especially during the spring, known as tornado season. The clash between cold air masses from the north and warm air from the Gulf of Mexico often produces severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. In March 1875, the perfect mix of conditions occurred, beginning in Mississippi and moving eastward through Georgia. Most tornadoes in the south are relatively weak, classified as EF1 or EF2. However, occasionally conditions are perfect for an outbreak of severe tornadoes which often reach EF4 and EF5. On March 20, 1875, an intense and fast-moving weather system produced 19 tornadoes across the south, including a devastating EF4. The news of the pending disaster reached the farms and communities north of Columbus, Georgia, mere moments before the behemoth arrived. There was no emergency broadcasting system, radio or television, and no social media to send out warnings. The people living near Columbus, Georgia, had no way of knowing how drastically their lives would change that day. The first tornado of the day touched down in Lee County, Alabama. As the storm crossed the Chattahoochee River into Georgia, it quickly produced four spin-off tornadoes. Two of the tornadoes primarily produced property damage. The remaining two were the problem and responsible for the loss of life in Harris and Talbot counties. This part of Georgia was populated by large plantations and small communities before the Civil War. In 1875, the region changed following the war. Many large farms were still intact but tenant farmers, also known as sharecroppers, replaced slave labor. The region was still primarily poor. Landowners still controlled the wealth, and farmers lived in substandard housing and worked on the farms for subsistence wages. A natural disaster only made life more difficult for an already difficult existence. The tornado first hit the home of the Nathan Nicholson farm, Seven houses and barns were lost. His son's home was destroyed, and the son was badly injured but recovered. By 11 a.m., the storm passed near the small communities of Ellerslie, Waverly Hall, and Mount Airy, or Ridgeway. Houses, churches, and businesses were left in rubble or spread across the countryside. Ridgeway was destroyed, including most of the members of the Kennan family, and recorded the deaths of most of them. The weather system remained strong throughout the day, producing numerous long-range tornadoes that damaged at least eight Georgia counties and three in South Carolina before dissipating. Many families lost all their worldly possessions that day. Some experienced the more significant loss of family members. Entire communities were destroyed and some were not rebuilt. In Harris and Talbot counties, we find the sad stories of the Pitt and Baugh families and the substantial loss of much of the Kennan family. Farms like the one belonging to the Kennan family were utterly destroyed. Unfortunately, one of the most tragic stories involves the Kennan family. Captain J.H.S. Kennan and two of his sons were away from home that morning when word reached them of the storm. They were in the nearby small town of Ridgeway when the news arrived. Captain Kennan decided to head home, hoping to be with his family until the storm passed. 
As he drew near his home, Kennan discovered to his horror that he was too late. The tornado was ripping his house apart before lifting it into the air. Part of the house landed a half mile away. As he watched the horrific scene unfold and saw his house and barn destroyed, he noticed what brought even more terror to a father's heart. His family was thrown through the air hundreds of yards from the home. Mrs. Cannon and his children were dead. Several of his farmhands who took shelter in his house were dead as well. Some reports indicate that Mr. Kennan was injured, though how is unknown. Like many of his neighbors, Captain Kennan and his two sons were left with nothing. Ridgeway was destroyed. The stores, church, school, and post office were gone and would never return. Boreville was a small community in Talbot County near Ridgeway that developed around the Boar Plantation. The community was home to a successful blacksmith shop, general store, post office, and school. Several tenant homes were located in the area. The Baugh family had the largest home in the community. Since most of the community lived in substandard housing, the Baugh family welcomed them to find shelter in their home until the storm passed. Reports are that Mr. Baugh prayed over the group as the winds began to beat on their house. When the storm passed, the Baugh home and all the other homes were a pile of debris. Mr. Baugh prayed for no loss of life and no one died, though all structures in Bawville were destroyed. The Baugh family, once wealthy, never recovered. They rebuilt a home, but with the loss of their blacksmith business and Mr. Baugh's declining health, they could only build a small farmhouse. Mr. Baugh died a couple of years later. His widow spent the rest of her days in that small home. The Harris and Talbot tornadoes traveled over 20 miles each in two long-range paths. One hit the small community of Hamilton. Property damage was extensive, and at least three lives were lost in the storm in one family. The home of H.W. Pitts took a direct hit. Pitts, his wife, and one daughter were injured. Three of his other daughters were killed. Also killed were perhaps six sharecroppers who lived on his land, but these individuals were often left unnamed in sources or not counted. Unfortunately, official records at this time were not always accurate and frequently omitted people of color. When news reached Sparta, Georgia, in Hancock County, of the storm passing some six miles to the south, a rescue party formed to see if they could help. When they arrived at the small community, everything was gone. Debris was everywhere. Timber and other obstacles lay in the old road, making access to the scene difficult. The most extensive damage occurred to the home of S.D. Massey. The Massey home took a direct hit. What had been a beautiful plantation home and farm earlier, complete with a frame house, servants' quarters, stables, and gin houses, was now gone. The family's main house caught the wind from the tornado and lifted into the air before coming apart and being carried away. Some other structures, like the servants' quarters, were gone, leaving only the stones behind them that served as their foundation. Pieces of the house and household items were strewn across the fields and the woods far from the home site. The loss of life was more tragic. Mr. Massey and his family were huddled in the house at the time. Along with his wife and child was a family friend, Miss Berry, and a house servant. Mrs. Massey and the others had been in the outside kitchen making cakes, unaware of what was coming their way. The family sat to eat lunch. Suddenly, Mr. Massey heard the strangest roaring noise he ever heard. He described the sound as a rushing, howling, crashing, indescribable noise. He looked outside and noticed the sky was darkening quickly. Mr. Massey assumed a spring storm was coming, but the sound of the wind bothered him. This could only be one thing. He looked outside and saw the massive cloud coming his way. 
Mr. Massey decided to get the family out of the house to find safety outside, perhaps in a ditch or some stronger structure than a house that could lift. He tried to lead them out but could only push them through the door when the storm hit the house. The walls caved in. An object hit Mr. Massey on the head, knocking him unconscious. When he awakened, rain was hitting his face. He looked around and realized he was outside. He came to his senses and started looking for his family. He saw his wife's lifeless body covered in debris. A beam hit her head and crushed her skull. She died instantly. He continued to search for his only son. The desperate father searched through the rubble and rain, looking for his son, hoping by some miracle he survived. He found his three-year-old's lifeless body in the garden. Every bone appeared to be broken, and he had a large gash in his side. The search continued. The servant girl's body was found under the debris. Miss Berry was found on the top of a pine tree that had fallen during the storm. She had a large wound on the head and her legs were broken. She was still alive but suffered terribly until she died later that day. Others were wounded in the outer houses of the Massey Plantation. All were in serious condition. Unfortunately, we have no follow-up reports concerning their condition. Mr. Massey's neighbors, Mr. Thomas Little and Mr. Carpenter, lost their homes, but there was no loss of life. The Little's home lifted some 12 feet from its foundation before being destroyed. Little and his family survived by seeking shelter outside of their house. Unfortunately, some tenant farmers who still lived on the plantation were injured. We have no record of their recovery from their injuries. By the end of the day, several high-powered tornadoes had ripped across the Georgia landscape. The storm left widespread devastation, with around 400 people reported injured and at least 100 recorded casualties. Entire farms and communities were destroyed and many were never rebuilt. The storm system continued across Georgia, dropping destructive tornadoes until it entered South Carolina. The terror finally stopped, but not before the damage was done. In the absence of modern emergency services, recovery efforts relied heavily on the resilience and cooperation of the local population. Neighbors helped each other rebuild, and makeshift shelters were set up for those who had lost their homes. Sadly, some farms and communities like Ridgeway were abandoned. The landscape forever changed that day. The loss of livelihood that followed forced many of the poor to make a living some other way. Some took this opportunity to move west towards Texas. The tornado outbreak of 1875 is a stark reminder of the importance of preparedness in the face of natural disasters. Today, we have the advantage of advanced technology and communication systems. This technology can provide early warnings and help us take appropriate action to stay safe. While we cannot control the weather, we can minimize its impact on our lives. The resilience and determination of the 1875 tornado outbreak affected individuals and communities in a major way. Some lost their lives and others lost all their worldly possessions. Some survivors may have moved to a new location, but many chose to rebuild and restart their lives. Today, many old farms and communities like Ridgeway are only remembered by the cemeteries left behind, often overgrown and shrouded in woods. All other signs of life are gone. Much of this land is owned by timber companies now and used for growing trees. Hopefully, projects like this will keep the history of this once vibrant region alive. The 1875 tornado outbreak is a testament to the strength of the human spirit and the progress we have made in understanding and responding to the forces of nature. Let us remember the lessons of the past as we continue to build a safer future for our families. Thank you for watching.
Robert Grice and Mercy Creek Media created this video. All rights reserved. Please like, share, and subscribe.